So hello and welcome. Um, when, I, when I moved from the BBC to CNN as a journalist, I went from London to Atlanta, Georgia in the USA. And Atlanta at the time, in the early 90s, was one of the fastest growing cities uh, in the world, um, boasting of how many of the countries uh, of the US uh, top companies were moving there, already located there. CNN was there, Coca-Cola was there, um, Home Depot, one of the big uh, DIY places. And it was getting ready to host the Olympics in 1996. Ironically, also around that time, it was also listed as one of America's most dangerous cities, uh, which has changed, thank, thank you. But anyway, uh, the thing that struck me the most was, was that when I went away for a couple of weeks uh, on, on assignment for CNN, uh, I'd head off somewhere and come back, and suddenly there's a new road or a new road junction or traffic lights. And I was like, that wasn't here just a couple of weeks ago. And I was shocked at how fast it was growing. And then in 2001, January 2001, I was invited to come to Dubai for the opening of uh, Dubai Media City. And I fell in love with the place. I built a home here and uh, thought, you know, this is amazing. This city's growing so quickly. And I didn't realize how quickly till I traveled for a couple of weeks and came back. And it wasn't traffic lights or a road junction. It was skyscrapers and spaghetti, uh, spaghetti road junctions and, and flyovers and man-made lakes. It was, it was quite remarkable. So I think the, the UAE has managed to defy uh, all expectations by building such a unique community, not just in terms of physical infrastructure, but also in terms of community and diversity of population. And I think that this um, country recognizes that building cities of tomorrow um, is, is not just about building physical infrastructure, but also building infrastructure and community in a very smart way. So it's ideal that we're discussing cities of, of tomorrow here at this, uh, mm. at this uh, session here at the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature. And we're going to get an interesting uh, conversation here. I want to introduce our wonderful panel. I'm going to start with Roma Agrawal, who's uh, there on the end. She's the author of uh, Built, The Hidden Stories Behind Our Structures, giving a very unique insight uh, into how humans have created infrastructure, literally from mud huts to skyscrapers. Mm. Uh, she's an award-winning structural engineer and an advocate for inclusivity in engineering. And I'm going to ask you more about what that means uh, as the, the debate continues. Uh, in the middle, we have Dr. Tony Juniper, who is a renowned environmental campaigner. Uh, he asks, in a way reminiscent of Monty Python, what has nature ever done for us? Mm. I don't know if you know the reference to what have the Romans <laughs> ever done for us in Monty Python's uh, Life of Brian. And his book uh, explores the importance of keeping this planet alive as does his recent book, Rainforest, uh, examining what he considers to be Earth's most vital front line. And I'll get you to explain that too as well, Tony. Thank you. Uh, with me to my immediate uh, left here is uh, Saeed al Girgawi, who's the director of Dubai Future Academy, which aims at growing a pioneering generation here in the UAE with an eye to the future. So where does his organization's focus uh, lie? And we're going to look at that too. So thanks very much for being with us. I like to do sessions in a very open format where you get to ask the questions so you can take part and interact with uh, panelists who have often traveled very far to come to the UAE to take part in the festival. So it's always a great opportunity for you to be able to ask the questions. But just to get some perspective, I'm going to start off um, with a question to everyone. And perhaps, Rama, I can start with that question of <laughs> what is inclusivity in engineering? Yeah, so if we think about our cities, um, obviously all types of people occupy that space. And I'm going to ask a question. How many of you have ever had to queue for a toilet? Oh. And I think, I mean, all the women have put their hands up, effectively. <laughs> a few men have as well. But you know, when we think about the way our cities are designed, I don't think we're quite there yet with making sure that all different types of people and their different needs are accounted for. So with my little toilet example, um, designers decided at some point in the past that we should assign equal area for men's and women's toilets. But of course, our biology, our bodies are different, and so women inevitably end up um, queuing for the toilet. So I think when I talk about inclusivity in engineering, it's about making sure that we are truly incorporating the needs of all different types of people in society um, in that. And I mentioned a couple of other examples to you. One is um, I have a seven-month-old daughter now, and suddenly London seems like quite an unfriendly place to travel around, whereas before I just thought, oh, the tube is so magnificent, you can travel everywhere, but yeah. most stations don't have lifts, mm. and that causes me a lot of challenges. Mm. Um, and also an aunt of mine recently had a stroke, and she's doing pretty well, but she needs a wheelchair to travel long distances. Um, while my pram can be carried down ste steps with the help of lovely strangers, you can't do the same with a wheelchair. So. You know, we really need to think about 
um, how do we incorporate really the full needs of society when we're thinking about the future of our cities? I'll dig a bit deeper there to, uh, as we continue the conversation to see how we are making progress, perhaps. Um, but perhaps, Said, I can and bring you in here. The UAE is blessed with um, a growth and, and smartness in, in sort of city growth that allows it to perhaps learn from other places' mistakes. And, and to do something where it can take into account those mistakes or anomalies that other places have and, and get them right. How much, from your experience, has there been an effort to make sure things like these, these ideas, like Roma has been talking about, can actually be considered before construction starts, before uh, any, any progress is made? So uh, from what I know, and, and going back to, to what you mentioned, Dubai even learns from its own mistakes, uh, especially uh, when it comes to uh, building spaghetti roads in particular. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to uh, building structures and the like, I know that there is an, uh, an index that not only the municipality has, but the road, ha uh, road authority has in terms of uh, building inclusive roads or as inclusive as possible even um, including or changing the terminology of those uh, who are disabled to people of determination in the UAE and ensuring that there is, whether it was the metro, whether it was uh, the malls, uh, they boast the fact that they can uh, accommodate uh, as many uh, people and uh, their needs uh, as a result. Um, and I know that Obviously, it's not a perfect index that they, uh, they do focus on, but it's something that's always work on in progress mm -hmm. uh, as the projects get crazier and uh, the inclusivity aspect needs to be taken into consideration even more. Okay, so I'm gonna bring in uh, Dr. Tony Juniper here. And, and Tony, I guess uh, we're discussing smart cities, cities of the future, but if nature isn't one of the, the stakeholders in the conversation, we might not really be going in the right direction. Let me get your take on that. Um, yes, indeed. So uh, we have this growing awareness about the challenges we face in relation to the decline of the natural environment and the challenge of climate change at the same time as we have this massive surge of urbanization taking place on the planet. I just did the back of the envelope numbers this morning just to try and get some sense of what's coming over the next 30 years. So 2050 now is often talked about in relation to various environmental targets. And if you look at between 2020 and 2050, we're expecting the population to go from around 7.7 .7 billion now to 9.5 billion by mid-century. If you look at the trend towards urbanization, we passed for the first time in 2008, after 10,000 years of cities developing in our world, that was the first time we passed 50% of us living in, in towns and cities. If you look to 2050, it's gonna be between two thirds and three quarters living in cities. If you take even the two thirds lower end estimate and you add that into the population growth and do the basic arithmetic, we're gonna need an increased urban capacity on the planet 150 times the current size of London. Just kind of let that settle for a second. London is not a small city. You think of all the concrete and steel, all the food and water needed to feed that uh, concentration. And then you think about the economic growth, which is what cities are for. Historically, people have moved from the countryside to cities, which explains the current trend in order to get better lives, more income, more jobs, more economic opportunities. So we can see the surge in demand accompanying continuing urbanization at a time when we know we've got to get to zero carbon emissions by 2050, mm. at the same time as stopping deforestation and indeed reversing it. And bear in mind that deforestation is being driven most, most obviously by food production and demand for different food, namely meat. And those fires we saw in the Amazon this year are really down to soya bean and beef production which is in turn feeding increasingly middle-class lifestyles linked in some part to the trend of urbanization. So you see this planetary kind of uh, challenge at the same time as this planetary demand and putting those two things together, we've not really begun to even think about what that means yet in terms of the, the metabolism, you might call it, of future cities. What's coming in, sustainable, and what's going out to be recaptured and turned into a circular economy. That's the challenge, but we've not really, to date, begun to put the pieces in place to deliver that. So that's the way I see the challenge of the future city, is 
a metabolism that's literally sustainable. What's coming in is zero carbon, right. and what's going out is not causing an environmental impact. So that's the exam question, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to open it up, actually, straight away here, and let's see if any hands go up. So thanks, Ian. Put them nice and easy to you, sir, and then I'll come to you, ma'am. Uh, and tell us your name, where you're from, and if you have to direct a question to anyone in particular. Um, yes, it is, actually. It's uh, Jeff Sanderson. I'm uh, a landscape architect, amongst other things. Um, my question is really directed more at what's likely to happen in Dubai. Given that leaders in the automotive industry are saying that private transport is, um, will wane over um, a very short period, probably by 2030, as late as 2035, very few of us will own our own cars. That the need for uh, big highways, um, I love spaghetti, so I'm sorry that will have to stay, but the, <laughs> the need for massive road infrastructure is going to become less and less. Um, and and uh, th that means an, an entire change in the way we live, um, which affects a lot of the details that, that you're sort of referring to. It affects the environmental um, worthiness um, of, of, of Dubai. But in terms of you know, a young person thinking about the future of Dubai, I, I'd love to hear more. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to put this to you because actually, um, from what the gentleman was saying, it's not necessarily that the road structure won't serve any purpose. It's, I guess, the idea is we'll have more autonomous vehicles, more grouping of people traveling. Hopefully, obviously, mm -hmm. that results in less congestion. And, but presumably, um, the way you know, the, the smart city will grow, um, studies are being done to try to, to make sure that there's a balance between what infrastructure is put down and how that infrastructure is used. Yes, so uh, even looking back at when I first uh, got my license, it was a big deal. You know, I can have this freedom and I can go uh, to places wherever, uh, whenever I need. But today, because of Uber, Kareem and, and the like, that need isn't there. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, autonomous vehicles. Dubai Silicon Oasis uh, City is designated as one of those cities where they're testing the viability and how the street or the road can adapt to autonomous vehicles. Um, and so that's, in my opinion, still a working, uh, there isn't an answer for it in particular when it comes to Dubai. I know that the, the, when you go on Sheikh Zayed Road, you see 12 lane highways. Um, something needs to happen when it comes to that, in particular when it comes to um, the less usage of, of roads or people owning uh, cars. Uh, from what we've seen, the trend in the UAE seems to happen at a later stage um, in comparison to the West. So now we do see that this trend is happening in the West. People, in particular younger people, are not inclined to own vehicles. Uh, even when it comes to homes as well. Um, and we know that, at least the, the, the positive side is that we know we have some time when, until that trend hits us. But even when it comes to the culture of, of cars, there is a massive culture, some of you may know, when it comes to owning a vehicle, sort of like a rite of passage, in particular when it comes to this part of the world, uh, just because in addition when it comes to even the design of, of cities, right? I mean, if you look at Dubai, Dubai is quite wide. Um, and we were having this conversation uh, back uh, in the green room where we need to relook uh, or look back at the old designs of, of the cities when there were no narrow streets, the city was relatively smaller. But then another question comes in, what happens to that infrastructure that you've already invested in and you've already built? Um, and I think that's a, a living experiment that uh, Dubai needs to, to work with. Rama, I'm going to ask you on this, just to follow up on the gentleman's question. Does, uh, you know, do structural engineers consider the possibility that a lot of the work that's being done, perhaps now and has been done in the last decade or two, will essentially become redundant because of dramatic changes in the way society? I mean, home, uh, people not commuting anymore, working from home, for example, would have an impact on the volume of people traveling. Yeah, so I think if I look at London, that's a positive thing because we have quite old infrastructure, so we almost have the opposite problem mm. to Dubai where you can kind of, you have this beautiful blank slate that you can create from. We have infrastructure that's over 150 years old, um, you know, without the lifts as I mentioned, and I think actually it's a good thing if people tend to work more flexibly, they work 
from home a little bit, then it actually eases some of the pressure off the public transport system, which is a good thing, it reduces congestion. Um, and from that point of view, I'm also therefore a fan of actually keeping the cities quite dense and not sprawling out and not kind of going out into the countryside and making sure that people don't have to commute very long distances because that's, you know, you hear of people spending four hours a day on a train um, just to come into work and have to go out again and, and that can't be a healthy, you know, mentally healthy lifestyle for, for anyone, for their families and so on. So I think as structural engineers, the trend that I'm finding interesting to watch is the trend towards uh, building higher because that is one way to densify a city. Um, going vertically. To go vertical. And you've, you know, London feels quite dense, I think, to people, but actually the center of Paris is, is more than twice as dense as London is. Mm. And that's because Paris, even Barcelona, tend to have buildings which are between five and eight stories tall. In London, we tend to have um, structures, you know, the one which I live in, which is two stories tall, these Victorian uh, terraces. Yeah. So there, there's a very interesting balance mm. um, to contrast you know, the newer cities like Dubai and really old cities like London and try and learn from each other that, you know, what is that right balance between the two and how can we keep all these people that you're describing um, healthy and, and, you know, impacting the environment as little as possible. Right. Um, the lady was waiting there with the microphone. We'll just get that. Thank you, Mohammed. Please do put your hands up clearly and I'll get you the microphone. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leila. I've been living in Dubai for five years. Absolutely loved it. And I appreciate your comment how, you know, not oh, a few months goes by and you see another skyscraper or shopping development. And I, I appreciate the ambition. And um, But what about green spaces? I, I'm really worried that, you know, it's not just for the aesthetic, but I attended a public policy forum in Dubai last year where you had a doctor from Harvard, I think, mentioning how less oxygen in the environment can lead to higher cortisol levels and increase you know, it, there, there are diseases that can be associated with that. So I appreciate that there are the, all these planning committees, yeah. you know, looking at the next 50 years. And yeah. so please reassure us that there's going to be more green spaces. And Tony, that, that's a key factor because you were saying about the intensify, intense urban, urbanization. It's yes. going to be a key factor, isn't it? Yeah, so, so th there's a very rich uh, academic literature being developed in different parts of the world now telling us about the multiple benefits of green space for people. And obviously, the more people you have, the more beneficial the green space in a kind of social and economic sense, therefore leading to the conclusion that the best place you can plant trees and have beautiful landscapes with water and vegetation is in cities. And I have to say, I've been struck here in Dubai that that opportunity, in some parts of the city at least, is being underutilized in terms of the well-being of, of the community here. Um, and actually, one of the reasons why London is relatively nice is that we do have um, quite a lot of spaces with you know, parks and gardens and everything else. And the reasons why this is so important, that they're multiple. So one thing is that you know, humans were conceived in nature. That's where we come from. And it's deep within us. And we, we can now measure the psychological benefit of being exposed to trees and grass and bushes and birdsong and water in our daily lives. There's also a very practical benefit in terms of air pollution. The best way you can reduce air pollution is, is with vegetation, green walls, trees, green spaces. And even if you go to electric vehicles, you still get particles coming from brake linings mm. on vehicles and tires. And so you still have an air pollution issue, even when you get rid of the internal combustion engine. And then the other thing, which I didn't think was an issue here until you showed me some pictures earlier, is, um, is flooding and mm. flood risk reduction. If you have green spaces, water gets absorbed into the ground. And I wouldn't expect Dubai to be prone to flood risk, but I did see some pictures earlier saying, to show that actually that, that has been a bit of a question. So the right kind of vegetation, native trees, which would also bring biodiversity into the city, this is a huge opportunity which you can increasingly measure from an economic point of view and a social well-being point of view. So cities really are the places where we need to be reforesting first. And not to say that everything else is not important, it's vital. But from the point of view of the benefits for people, the cities are the places to green. But Tony, I, would I have say. a yeah. question, actually. Yeah. Am I allowed to ask a question? Yeah. Um, so but, um, considering that the environment in Dubai and the Middle East yeah. is, is largely desert areas, yes. and you, you can't really compare it to London no, in a way. So how, how do you kind of find that yeah. right balance? Well, do you know what? I was walking around today in the old bit of the city, and there are some big, mature trees there that are doing extremely well. Mm. So I would think probably the right kind of species you, you could bring some vegetation into the city. You probably wouldn't have much grass, I wouldn't have thought, because of mm. the 
climate, but in terms of tree cover, which creates shade as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so deciduous trees in my part of the world are very good because they lose their leaves in the winter, so you get more light in, you need less electricity. In the summer, the leaves come and they shade the buildings and you need less air conditioning. And so, you know, trees can play vital roles even on the energy side, remarkably. In defense of Dubai, I mean, I've been here almost two decades and it, I've seen it become remarkably green over okay. those two decades. Yeah. Uh, to the extent a friend of mine came from Amman, Jordan, about 10, 12 years back and said, my goodness, Dubai's so green. Of course, Amman okay. is very different because it's very... Maybe uh, I've seen the wrong bit. No, but there is. There's a lot of greenery yeah. here. But, I, you know, one thing I always say to people is it, it, it takes time for trees to grow. Okay. And well, it does. Uh, watching that, yeah. Yeah. So but that, if, that, if, I, if I were mm. to add, usually when we look at greenery, and in particular here, uh, we always tend to look at what the West has done in terms of yeah. greenery, okay. in particular with London. <coughs> in terms of, if you look at when the early developments happen in Dubai, where the trees are situated at, they emulate at least uh, how, okay. the, how in part, exactly how yeah. London does it. And from what it seems to, to me in particular is, and we see that a lot in Abu Dhabi, where they've taken trees uh, that are native to um, the, the UAE. And uh, you yeah. mentioned in old Dubai there's this big tree, and that particular tree probably is the Ghaf tree. And that, the Ghaf tree goes 65 meters yeah, down right. in terms of exactly. root. And mm -hmm. yeah. so when, when looking at, mm. uh, and it doesn't need much water, mm. and when we have a lot of fog, mm. so it stores water as well okay. for, for the rest of the ecosystem. Mm. And that is where, uh, and we had a talk uh, about a year ago at the academy where we looked at how can we learn from different cities mm. in arid climates. Yeah, exactly, right? that would be the place. If we look at all right, the, the example of Texas, Arizona, yeah, right. uh, to the example of uh, other countries even in Africa that have taken, that have gone through the similar cycle that we have, or we looked at what are the best benchmarks, mm. and okay, it mm. tends to be the West. But then, all right, how do we now start to encompass more mm. of um, uh, the local vegetation, in yes. particular when it comes to, to trees. And one case study is, if you've ever driven to the uh, Al Khawanij Murdif area in Dubai, you pass by a massive forest of Ghaf, same tree, a Ghaf oh. tree. Okay. And just going from where the park starts till the end of it, on average, uh, five, uh, five degrees centigrade is the dip in oh, temperature. Wow. Yeah. So it's not that, That's huge. we do see that. Yeah. It's just the question is, all right, how do you, because then it comes to, we're used to the lush green trees and rough is grayish, greenish uh, tree. So it doesn't look that pretty. Uh, so even I think from the, mm. from the point of view of perspective mm. in changing that, but, but I definitely agree with you and, and, and we do see that here in Dubai. Um, and the, the, what I think needs to happen then is to decide on a range of trees that are native to uh, the, the region, I wouldn't say even to no. Dubai in particular, no. that can then benefit the rest of the ecosystem, mm. whether it was pollinators, whether it was uh, humans as well. Yeah, right. indeed. That would be an interesting experiment to oh, work yeah. out what the mix would be. Yeah. Okay, so our next question, my yeah. friend there, please. Mm. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. There go. yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Traudel Funke from University of Sharjah. Uh, lecturer for architectural engineering. So we, of course, uh, this is a big topic, <laughs> city of tomorrow. I don't mm. really know where to start and where no. to end. Uh, <laughs> but I, I will just have w one question now. Vertical farming. We, we talked about sustainability of food. Mm. So I think especially here in Dubai, we are like, I don't know exactly the percentage, but more than 90% we are Basically, we have to import food yeah. to, uh, to feed the population. Mm. And, uh, and of course, this import is not very sustainable. Yeah. So in terms of sustainability, I think there are a few farming projects now in, uh, in the UAE, but there could be much more. And since Dubai is always like a step ahead, uh, I, I would like to know what, uh, yeah. are there yeah. any future plans yeah. to support uh, vertical farming, which is definitely, uh, you, you need much less water for it, and it's very sustainable. Is, there, is, yeah. is that part of the remit of when you look ahead in the future? Yeah, yeah. so that's absolutely part of, of it. Now, the issue with 
uh, vertical farming is then the AC that you need to use and the energy. So yes, you're not, um, you're, you're, there's the decrease in the amount of, in particular, emissions and cost, but then, exactly. But then there is a lot of cost that goes into keeping uh, the outside temperature of 50, not in, uh, impacting the crops within. Mm -hmm. So a big project that's happening is with Emirates. So uh, they've already built a large facility for vertical farming of lettuce and Sorry. other, yeah, and other um, uh, mm. crops that they would need to feed uh, all of their clients and, and the airlines. And I think that is one of the big projects that, uh, fingers crossed, it successfully uh, impacts, positively impacts uh, Emirates, mm. hopefully, and that we'll see a large adoption of, um, mm. of, of this technology in particular. Mm. Uh, there are many small startups that are happening throughout the UAE, mm. and many different, uh, uh, in particular, Emiratis own farms. Mm. And when it comes to farmers, the knowledge of how to use these technologies, and even through our conversations that we're having with the Ministry of Climate uh, Change and, uh, and the environment, the, the biggest challenge is not the adoption of technology, is the right, right usage of this technology and whether it is, so for the farmer, if, it, if that investment is needed or is it, can I then put it back into my crop? Uh, rather than just adopting technology for the safe, mm. sake of uh, adopting it, but then the rest of the workers and the farmers not having the right uh, training, I would say, mm. to be able to adopt this successfully. Mm. So, for the, so it becomes a more economic venture as well for the, for the farmers. But there are a few startups. Uh, there is a ma big success when it comes to fish farm. There is a company called right. Fish Farm uh, in Jabal Ali that's fish farming salmon, sea bass, Really? Uh, yeah, wow. and, and they're already commercially selling it wow. in some of the uh, <coughs> luxury uh, uh, I think salmon down here. It, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So they, they simu simulated the environment yeah. of salmon. Cold water. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, but even reached some regional um, mm. aquatic uh, mm. uh, life that, mm. uh, that we, we tend to use as well and like. But at the same time, there is, uh, I'm trying not to digress so far from, from your question, there is this increase in the, uh, or awareness of where our food is coming from yeah. uh, here. So there is a startup called uh, C, it's called Fish Souk, that uses blockchain to ensure where are you getting your food from, and is it fresh, is it sustainable, and how can you then uh, focus on that? So they work a lot with the fish market here uh, to do that. So I, I, but going back to your question, I think everyone's working in silos. And a big part of mm -hmm. uh, the Minister of Food, uh, Future Food Security, she uh, in September launched uh, a big paper on sort of mm -hmm. a whole over uh, look, looking the, uh, not just when it comes to aqu uh, aqu uh, aqua farming and aero farming and, and the like, but even when it comes to marine fishing uh, and all of the different practices right. that are used, used there. So everyone seems to be working in silos yeah. and both the Minister of, of, uh, uh, of um, mm. Climate Change and the Minister of uh, Future Food Security are trying to mm. figure out how do we put mm. all of the efforts under one umbrella so it, it's a cohesive and more effective mm. effort. Uh, Thanks, Sayed. Before I get to you, I want to just follow up with Roma on this, is that mm. there's a lot of competition really interesting. between cities and city levels and so on. I wonder how much mm. uh, more collaboration <laughs> is starting to happen, sharing technologies, as mm. Sayed had indicated, the, you know, the, the silos exist. And you, you know, for mutual benefit, really there needs to be more collaboration. Are you seeing any signs of it in your particular field? So I have tended to work for quite large engineering corporations through my career. So from my perspective, um, you know, my company that I currently work for has offices in 100-ish countries. And, and we talk to each other, we move to different countries. I visited the Australian offices. You know, you see people from different countries moving to the UK and, and vice versa. So I see quite um, a good, you know, structure of collaboration. And of course, it can always be better. Um, but I'm fairly positive about it. And I think especially when it comes to, so you know, I find it very interesting that no matter where you are in the world, you tend to use steel and concrete as your primary 
um, materials to build the larger structures. Of course, the smaller structures can vary, but those are the same materials, and those and the properties are the same all over the world. And so, actually, the skills that we have as engineers are, are very highly transferable. And so, you know, the, the kind of the field is really ripe for for that collaboration because there is that commonality between um, all of us. Okay, um, the young lady's been waiting patiently. There, we'll get the microphone to her. Hi, my name is Madeline Hahn. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, and I wanted to ask a question about inclusivity. In, um, because I've, I've been curious, I, since I've been pregnant, it's been difficult to walk distances, and I suddenly noticed that there are no benches in the world. <laughs> it feels often like there just aren't benches. And, but on the other hand, I read an article about Los Angeles, where I'm from, which said that they intentionally avoid putting in benches specifically to not provide places for homeless people to sleep because that would create a place where people would feel like I don't want to be in this part of town, this is no longer a safe area, et cetera, et cetera. So they create intentionally hostile environments. Like they'll change the, the light fixtures to be a color that's less attractive so you don't want to be there. It's they, they going on and on. So there's these two different forces one side that wants to be more inclusive and the other side that wants to be more hostile in order to control how people function in the city. And I wonder how, as someone like you, who works on this, can respond to that. So, I, um, so my job isn't directly in that, but obviously as, as somebody who's, who lives in cities, um, first, first of all, congratulations on the pregnancy and I hope it goes very well for you. Um, LA is a very interesting city to me because it is so sprawled and you know, I find that you can't actually get around very well without having a car because of lack of public transport and so on. And I think on your homeless point, wouldn't it be nice if they solved homelessness rather than actually trying to prevent the homeless person from sleeping on a bench? So I feel like if you had a much bigger, broader vision of you know, where this economic inequality is actually coming from. How do we solve that economic inequality in the first place so that the homelessness doesn't exist and then you don't need this hostility, not that it should exist anyway. So I agree and I mean that really comes to politics I think and you know to you know policy and how do we want to treat the people in our cities, how are we going to bring diversity into our cities. Um, and you know we as engineers we can lobby for that, we can do what we can from our perspective but I really want to see um, you know, governments, people that have policy-making powers to, to hear from us and say, well, you know, this is the way that we should be thinking about the future. Mm. Tony, a slight shift in the conversation here in terms of, uh, we're talking about cities becoming bigger urban sprawls, uh, and air quality obviously is a major concern mm. in, in, in that mm. case. As you say, even electric vehicles have mm. brake dust and so on. Mm. Um, I wanted to get back to something I mentioned right at the beginning where I described, uh, you know, in the book, uh, Rainforest, that you wrote, mm. you say that really the rainforest is the front line. Explain mm. that. So it takes us somewhat away from the conversation about cities, although not completely, as I described a moment ago, in terms of the sustainability of the supplies coming into cities, which is one of the reasons why the rainforests are being cut down still at a terrifying rate. But the reason I, I use that phrase, most vital front lines, is because of the multiple huge impacts that are accompanied by the loss of the tropical rainforests. And so We've had a lot of discussion recently about carbon, quite correctly, and it is the case that the deforestation we've seen over the last couple of decades has put as much carbon into the atmosphere as the entire global transport system. All the aircraft, all the cars, all the ships, all the trucks, that's an incredible phenomenon. And that is not only an emissions problem, it's also removing a sink because those forests were, until they were cut down, they were sucking in carbon. They, they were helping us to keep a lid on global warming. So there's that piece. Another piece which is potentially more important in some ways is the water cycle. So the tropical rainforests are these colossal engines of energy being pumped into the atmosphere that are driving atmospheric circulation at literally a continental scale. So some of the rain falling on the grain fields of South Dakota, even into Manitoba in Canada, that's being pushed into the atmosphere by the Amazon rainforest. Mm. And those big droughts that we saw in Brazil in 2014, some of the scientists working in Brazil, they linked that with deforestation in the Amazon. And it's not only an issue for food production, that country's power supply, 80% of it is coming from hydroelectric dams. And like, you know, there is a connection. Rain, rainforest, these things are connected. And if it stops raining, then the rivers stop flowing and you have power cuts, which is exactly what happened. So there's that dimension. 
And then there's the biodiversity. These ecosystems have at least 50% of the species diversity on land on our planet in about 7% of the land area. And from that biodiversity, we've developed drugs, we've developed many of our basic staple foods, and we're finding also engineering solutions from the biodiversity in terms of how evolution has invented solutions to different problems. For example, solar panels being designed now based upon the nanostructures in butterfly wings. Right. And then you've got this incredible cultural diversity. So many different societies that live in the tropical rainforest. On the island of New Guinea alone, there's 850 different languages that have evolved in different valleys and on different mountains, and those are being annihilated at the same time. You put all that together, I think this is the biggest catastrophe that's taking place on the Earth right now, is the disruption of these systems. And of course, it's not only local decisions that are driving this, it's global supply chains for oil palm, for beef, for soya beans, for timber, and that's where then, you know, the footprint of countries becomes really quite an important part of how we can look at this. I'm delighted to hear you have this sustainability approach in terms of imports and checking the sources of some of these products, because in the end, one of the most powerful things that the consumer can do, mm -hmm. including these incredibly um, important hubs of economic activity in cities, is to say we don't want deforestation in what we're consuming. Right. And so there's a positive... Uh, force that can be put back the other direction as well as the destructive one in terms of what we presently do very often. And that information is more readily available now, isn't it? So it's easier to get that to yes. people. Like writing calories on a biscuit or something. Well, the blockchain thing that I mentioned, you know, there's technologies now that right. can begin to, to work out, you know, the truth of what's at the far end of the supply. Yeah. yeah. Any other hands going up quickly? I just want to make sure, I, yeah, I'll come to you and then I'll come to you afterwards. The gentleman there. I'm Adam Wilde, good afternoon. Um, in the event that it's not possible to reverse the situation in Brazil, given that they seem you know, quite keen on their activities, you, you know, isn't, it the, isn't it important to focus on a replacement? So I noticed that there's a mangrove um, initiative going on in um, UAE, for instance, mm. um, and uh, uh, that seems quite straightforward actually, being as it, mangroves survive on brackish water. Mm. So, you know, that kind of, do, do, in your opinion, does that replace it to some extent? So <coughs> is, isn't there, shouldn't there be a policy of, of replacement rather yeah. than uh, bitching about the Brazilian government, which yeah. obviously I'm glad to join in on, but yeah. you know, nevertheless, it seems yeah. somewhat um, hopeless. Yeah. So, um, should, may, should, Please. Should I, yeah. so, so the, um, the short answer is it's both and. So we need to protect what's still there for all sorts of reasons because, well, it's literally irreplaceable, but we also need to be recovering forest cover where we can. And there are good reasons for increasing forest cover pretty much everywhere, but for different reasons. And so I would strongly encourage people in this part of the world to be replacing the coastal mangroves. Um, a, that's a massive carbon store. B, the sea level is rising as a result of ice melt and thermal expansion and mangroves are self-adjusting sea defences. So that's the cheapest way of defending land from the ocean. Uh, and they are also incredibly important for fisheries nurseries. So if you've got an ocean-based fishery, mangroves are very good for topping up the baby fish that you're going to catch in the future. So there's three very important economic reasons right there. And as you say, they are a weed. You put the seeds in and that comes back very quickly. So that's a very cheap fix. And you know, there's other things you can do in different parts of the world um, which um, are uh, sensible to do from the point of view of the local benefits you get as well as the global one in terms of the carbon storage. Actually, mangroves are very effective at carbon storage because not only do they catch carbon in the wood, they're also trapping sediments with organic material in them. And as the sediments build up, so you get this layer of carbon-rich material beneath the, the, the forest. So I would think in this part of the world, alongside the greening of the urban areas with native trees, the mangroves going in would be a very, very good thing to do. Just one other little connection with the city's discussion, and this is a structural engineer's question, um, is the extent to which we can be making cities carbon sinks by using wood instead of concrete, steel, and glass to be making the structural fabric of cities. Have you ever come across this discussion lately in terms of long-lived timber being mm. a, a carbon store? Yeah, so um, of course the really important part of that equation is to make sure that the timber that you're using is sustainable exactly. because otherwise yeah. you're only contributing to yeah. taking trees down, which is not a good thing. No, exactly. Um, timber, um, 
it's a really good material to build with if you're building kind of lower structures. We're still kind of grappling with fire protection, for example, although you do now um, have technologies where you can impregnate uh, timber with chemicals that basically makes it more fireproof. And then there are certain species of timber which basically char when they get burnt, and then that char becomes an insulation okay. stopping the rest of it from burning. Mm -hmm. So there's very clever ways in which you can design timber. Um, I think the biggest pioneers we're seeing in timber technology, so of course Scandinavia, because that's um, a very a natural resource there. Yeah. Canada's another one. And I think it's in Tokyo or in Japan somewhere that they are now looking at the tallest skyscraper that they can build out of timber. So people are definitely pushing the boundaries on it. Okay. And I think the tallest they've gone now is about 14 stories. Wow. And I think that's a, that's a good height. Mm. And you might need a bit of steel mm. to kind of bolster that sort of mm. structure up. And, and maybe a bit of concrete to create some fire safe cores that people can escape through. But right. you know, absolutely, we should be okay. looking at um, a combination of materials. Mm. Amazing. There was a hand that went up near the back. Did, there we go. Oh, is it mm. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, this is on the rainfall which we have just started, the, the cloud seeding in Dubai. And my question is to all of you in the panel, or any one of you. They, on one hand, we want rainfall. It is such a welcome thing. But on other hand, we see you know, the city is not really prepared for it. The house is not really prepared for it. The routine comes to a standstill with a little bit of rainfall. Mm -hmm. So is, some, is something in the pipeline? Are we doing something about it? Mm -hmm. This is one of the questions. And there's one more mm -hmm. question, if I can. Go ahead quickly then, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Go. So the second question is, like, uh, if we can do something about you know, exchanging the plants, making a startup where we can build cottage farming, something like that, Okay, uh, let's start to with have the more organic food. Let's start with the, the uh, cottage farming. I think there is quite a bit, isn't there? Sorry. Uh, I think, yeah, there is. So um, in particular, when it comes to the summer, um, that's when uh, it's in, in particular why it's being used here. But I don't think it has yet to, to pick up. On a big scale. On a big scale. Yeah. Uh, again, it's probably just prototypes and, and experimentation with it. I hear on the radio quite yeah. regularly, though, there's young startup companies mm -hmm. trying to find solutions like vertical growing and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And but then, uh, and, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, and then on the issue of um, the climate and the way it's been changing, we've had uh, rain and the seeding and stuff. Mm -hmm. where, where do we stand on that? So I think in particular with the last storm we had, uh, that's definitely something that is... So the, and when it comes to the infrastructure for rain, in particular, I know more about Dubai than the rest of the Emirates. Dubai has the infrastructure, but the issue comes in because of the dusty weather uh, for most of the year, that dust then gets collected uh, into the drainage. And that's why you find some, some flooding that happens in, in Dubai. Uh, and then the question is, how do you then uh, be able to... I would say rain-proof that uh, or dust-proof that drainage and that infrastructure where already the city has uh, invested a lot of money into developing this infrastructure, uh, but it gets uh, I get disrupted by the dust that gets collected by okay. something as simple as that. Uh, so I'm sure that's something definitely it's, mm. uh, it's being not only talked about, but placed uh, into policy. Mm. Uh, just to, to mitigate that, uh, that change. And most of the heavier rain that happens here, it's not as a result of cloud seeding. It's usually from uh, various uh, impacts that are coming from the Indian Ocean or coming from north. Mm. Uh, but the cloud seeding uh, efforts, and that, my question is to Tony, mm. is the, the impact of it on the circular uh, uh, circular uh, nature of the atmosphere mm. around the globe. Mm. So I, I would think um, it's probably quite small mm. because it's always done on quite a local scale. Um, I mean, people talking about some of the climate solutions that might involve geoengineering, which would be, you know, planet scale interventions. But I think from what I've heard, I don't know much about it, but from what I've heard about the cloud seeding that's being tried here, it's pretty small in the greater scheme mm. of things in terms of whether that would have any impact on, on the environment. I mean, everything has some impact, but I would think that would be quite minimal in the scheme of things, would be my guess. But I, I would, 
I would um, defer to an atmospheric scientist to answer that one. Remy, you and I just, yeah, I had a quick point. Um, so we think of London as being this, you know, first world, super developed, you know, pioneering city. And I just wanted to say that every time there is more than two millimeters of rain in London, um, the sewage of London gets dumped directly into the Thames yeah. because our infrastructure for the sewage systems is also 150 years old, similar to our underground metro system. Um, and so that was designed for 4 million people. The population of London is now closer to 9 million people. So um, the, uh, the amount of sewage we produce basically fills up the sewer, so any rain basically causes um, all of that. But to be positive, there's a huge new project coming in to build um, a new sewer. So, yeah. Uh, there was a gentleman, keep your hand up, yeah, in the third row and then the second row, I'll come to you in a moment. So. Hi, uh, Jonathan Duff. Um, I'm struck, you know, when you travel around the world, there isn't a lot of difference uh, in the buildings between New York, Paris, Hong Kong, Singapore and Dubai. And yet there's an enormous difference in climate. And I'm just wondering, this, this is the land of the wind tower. Uh, whether there was any thinking behind um, adapting the architecture and the engineering to our climate here that um, would save, for example, the use of air conditioning <laughs> and the energy that that implies and the diseases that that uh, can spread and so on. Let me, let me first start with Roma. I, do you feel there is a similarity in the buildings, London, Paris, here? And so in a way, yes. So in terms of the materials we're using, which I mentioned, yes, there is quite a lot of similarity. Um, but a lot of the climate is incorporated in, in the materials and the buildings we use. So for example, in India, in the UAE, in the hotter countries, you tend to use concrete a lot more, whereas in the UK, you tend to use steel, depending on the usage. So the materials can vary, um, although the outside of them can often look quite similar. And of course, the other big difference is earthquake design. So in the UK, I never have to design my structures yeah. for earthquakes. It's, um, so it's an easy challenge in some senses, whereas the Burj Khalifa here has, has to withstand earthquakes. So, so in the kind of, in its skeleton hidden away are features which are very different. Um, but I agree that Mm. In some ways, we, we have to, to think about our future, we have to look backwards and see what were the people that were you know, originally from these places doing that was appropriate for the climate um, in, in the different countries around the world. Mm. And we have to learn from that. So um, the use of mud is, you know, it naturally keeps buildings cool. Uh, concrete actually has the same property, another reason why it is often used in the hotter climates. And the idea of, of the wind towers, natural ventilation, is one that's being used quite a lot. So there are now buildings in the UK that I'm aware of, and I'm sure there are more around the world. Um, and this comes back to a whole different discussion. When the architect, the engineers, all come together very early on in a project, then those kinds of features can be incorporated from day one. Um, so in terms of light, natural ventilation, so that, because in the UK, you sometimes do need cooling and sometimes you need heating. So how can we try and regulate the temperatures that comes down to materials engineering and also the way air is circulated? Okay, the gentleman's been waiting there and I'll come to you in a moment, yeah. Yeah, hi, Cameron first. I was just wondering what sort of role you see for bicycle and pedestrian transport around because it seems like something that we don't really consider in Dubai very much at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know that it's not very practical in the middle of summer, but a lot of other cities have snow and, you know, for an equivalent amount of time, it wouldn't be usable because <laughs> it's too cold or too hot. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering whether that's something that we should be thinking about a lot more. So, so for those of you who don't know, there's already around 200 kilometers mm -hmm. worth of, of, of bike tracks. Yeah, and I, I didn't mean to oh, sorry, But yes, I, I know from, from a point of view where, where the practicality of it. Yeah. So they're used a lot in neighborhoods, uh, Al Qudra bike track, yeah. but from the practicality point of view, I think that's not. Yeah, I have a lot of friends. A lot of friends in other cities who commute mm. to work. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think I think it was a lot of the the current infrastructure has not, uh, or the question of including uh, bicycle uh, uh, tracks around uh, the city, uh, just because the. The consensus here is no, but no one is going to ride in the in the in the heat. Uh, and but now, whenever you see large residential, in particular when it comes to Emirati housing, it's a big uh, must now to have uh, a large sort of. So you find one in, in Jumeirah in Al Khawanij. There is a massive uh, bike track that goes throughout all of the neighborhood, the supermarkets, the parks, 
uh, and the rest of sort of the uh, vital spaces within the neighborhoods. But I think then it comes from uh, the safety aspect of driving culture here isn't the safest, so let alone when you're in a car and, and let alone when you're uh, driving uh, or riding a bike. So I think that that's where the, the, the question or the dialogue has stopped, mm -hmm. is that one, when it comes to the climate, and two, when it comes to the, uh, the culture uh, does not exist. That's one, one that I've heard. Uh, but then you hear the other side of the argument is like, all right, provide it and we shall use it. So you're, we are seeing it a lot in, in the neighborhoods, that's where it's being used, uh, and Al Qudra. Uh, but I think when it comes to the downtown and the metropolitan area, uh, it hasn't been, I don't think it has been uh, placed in the planning. And a lot of these developments have been done by the developer. So it's not by, the, by RTA that has that as a, as a must. So then it becomes the private developers uh, needing to, to enforce this on their communities. Some have, some have not. Tony, I'm gonna get you chip in here. As much as we're seeing kind of this massive urbanization globally, are we getting, do you get a sense that we are also paying attention to issues such as you know the green spaces, the bike lanes and so on? Are you seeing um, a greater intelligence in how we approach things? I think so. I, th I think pretty much everywhere I go, these issues are, are more or less being discussed right. either by the city level or the national government, and you know, people are beginning to put two and two together. Um, I think really at the end, however, just putting all these issues together in terms of you know, building design, green spaces, standards, transport links, food supply, it's about master planning and mm -hmm. about thinking through how all these things interact together. And quite a lot of the time, you know, th there's an absence of a, of a planning framework that can, you know, bring together all these different challenges and questions and turn them into opportunities. And so in England at the moment, you know, I, I work for a government agency and I look around all of the demands that we have for food growing, housing, infrastructure, water supply, um, the uh, demands coming from conservation and the natural environment. We're thinking about how we catch carbon from the atmosphere in the land. And all of these things, you look at them, and there isn't a joined up view of how we do them all at once. And what we finish up having is arguments between two of them. So do we do houses or do we protect the green space? Do we put some wind turbines up or do we look after the beautiful view? Do we build this railway or do we have nature? And so we're kind of always never really quite seeing the answer because we don't have that joined up framework. And so for the cities of the future, I think, you know, the first thing is about master planning and just thinking about the kind of places that will be sustainable in 20, 50, 100 years time and just trying to anticipate some of that. Because the individual building, it's beautiful, it's green, but actually, you know, it's not answering the question uh, that could have been answered because we've put it miles away from where the people live and they've got to go long distances and there's no green space near it, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's the thing which I, I think um, is now required to help everyone, you know, put all these bits together is a, is a strategic planning, master planning framework. Collaboration and also learning from each other's mistakes. And it's collaboration. Yeah. And as I said earlier on, it's about, you know, getting out of the silos yeah. and being able to put different bits of the jigsaw together. It's quite, it's not easy, but I think that's the challenge. We've got time for one more yeah. question, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Hi, thanks for the wonderful panel. Just one more question about um, waste management in terms of the cities of tomorrow. So, you know, unfortunately, obviously deforestation and, and mm. you know removal of coral and things that's quite important but also how do we manage things like simple things like recycling i mean a lot of people have lost faith in recycling <coughs> because of the stories that we hear about really plastic not ever being recycled properly mm. how do we manage sewerage going into the future yeah. you know how do we manage you know piles and piles of garbage going into waterways mm. i mean is anybody thinking about that? Or, you know, or what can we do as citizens as well? Yeah. And you start with that. So just, yeah, i just give you um, a, a, hopefully a brief answer. So the, the ambition now, given what we know about these big challenges, we have to build a circular economy, right? And so the waste piece possibly is one of the most obvious aspects of that. And so if you want to build a circular economy, we're going to bring resources in 
We're going to use the resources, we're going to catch them, and we're going to make those into new resources. So waste becomes a thing of the past. The concept is done away with. If you want to go down that road, this is another example of the silo busting that has to occur. Because for a circular economy to work, let's say in plastic, you need the plastic producers, the people who make the polymers that are turned into bottles and bags, they've got to be part of the discussion. Then you need the consumer goods companies who design the things that we use. Then you need the retailers. Then you need the waste management companies. Then you need them to be all talking together and the government in terms of the policies they put around this. And at the moment, you've got somebody designing a bottle without any discussion with the government about standards or with the waste collection people in terms of how they can turn that back into a new bottle. And so we finish up with chaos. And you know, this is why recycling, which is just one aspect of the circular economy, is just not joined up with the rest of it. And so that, I think, again, it's the key to this, is how we integrate different bits of the, the puzzle. And so you can see this beginning to happen in some places, but we've got a long way to go. And part of the trouble is, is that we just focus on the failure of the recycling system, and we kind of stop there, and we get frustrated, and we kind of don't move on. So um, that, again, is something that can be fixed, and in different places is being fixed. So but I have that, yeah, one sorry. very quick yeah. example, because I know we're running out of time. Um, one quick example is that we use waste from the steel um, industrial process of manufacturing steel, mm. which is called ground granulated blast furnace slag, because um, mm. you, you always wanted to know about that. And then we use that as a cement replacement in concrete, and cement is the most carbon intensive part of the concrete material. And so up to 70, 80% of cement can be taken away and, and you can put GGBS into this concrete. And that concrete can only be used kind of close to the ground because it's not very pumpable mix. So you can't kind of pump it up to the top of the Burj Khalifa, for example. Mm -hmm. but, but that's one example of where you can kind of use waste products from one industry and put it into another and it helps with that right. um, okay. economy. Yeah, so literally economy. literally a, a one word answer as we wrap up, we're out of time. Uh, from, to all three of you, watching the direction we're going when it comes to how we're going to be in the next 20, 30 years, optimistic or not? Um, a cautious yes. <laughs> okay. Tony? I'm a total optimist. I get out of bed every morning thinking that we're going to solve all these problems. Okay. Uh, we have to have that approach, I think. And say, so, <laughs> I would say optimistic ish. Mm. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's good. We're yeah. in the right direction. So, and, uh, because every, what's, what's uh, in my opinion, what seems to happen is everyone seems to agree on the same thing, right? And then it all comes down to how we can learn from the people who are already walking the walk, mm. right? Um, and what's interesting is, at least from, from a Dubai perspective, is that there's a lot of learning from, just because Dubai mm. ends up interacting with many different mm. uh, cities, cultures, individuals from all, all around the world. And there's always this, uh, this chance to uh, not only take the learnings, experiment them, become this test bed, and then, then it, that knowledge going somewhere and being utilized. Yeah. Uh, well, ladies and gents, there we end it. A big round of applause, please, for the panel. Yes. Thank you very much. And of course, as always, thanks to our supporters and sponsors. We've got Emirates Litter Foundation, Emirates Airline, uh, Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, Diwa, Dubai Culture, Dubai Tourism, and the Mohammed bin Rashid uh, Foundation, Al-Maktoum Knowledge Foundation. So thanks to everyone. Thank you for attending and for your questions. Thank you.